that God has in store for you. And so indeed, before we go any further, we want to have a word of prayer, and then we want to dive right into our study. Let's pray. Kind eternal, loving Father, this morning, Lord, we are so appreciative for your words. They are indeed, as the psalmist says, a light unto our path. And so, Lord, we pray that you would guide this time as you spend together. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit may be evident. Beat back every force of darkness, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that not my words, nor my will, but thy will be done. Father, please, I'm asking, Lord, that you would regenerate, quicken every mind, Lord. May your Holy Spirit be with us and may he speak to us may indeed as we spend this time together dear lord that your name be glorified and your people may be blessed in jesus name amen Amen. indeed our topic this morning and um, i pray and hope that you have your bibles with you our topic this morning uh, will be know that he is near know that he is near and we'll be focusing on matthew 24 uh, 29 through verse 29 through 35 uh, matthew 24 chapter verse uh, 29 uh, through 35 and so indeed um, we have been really studying the word of god together our focus has uh, been on the book of matthew And we have endeavored to comb through the book of Matthew so far, and we have seen that it's relevant to our time. Now, we are clearly told in Inspiration, Volume 7, page 141, that the substitution of the laws of men for the law of God, the exaltation of mere human authority of Sunday in place of the Bible Sabbath is the last act in the drama when the substitution becomes universal god will reveal himself he will arise in his majesty to shake terrible the earth he will come out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the world for their iniquity and the earth shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain and so we see that when human authority wants to put in place laws that go contrary to the laws that god has set up in his word that we are told that god will arise and that he will reveal himself and so we are told carefully as we dive into the book of uh, matthew 24 and we've been studying so far for those that uh, may not have been a part of our study before, um, you can check out Zion Advent SD uh, Church on YouTube website, and you can connect the link uh, with the previous messages. We have had three messages in this series entitled The Signs of the Time. Uh, the first one, The Beginning of Sorrow. The second one, The Abomination, which make it desolate. And the third one, which is The Marvelous Working of Satan, And today, of course, we'll be looking at knowing he is near. Now, we are told in uh, the Testimonies to the Church, Volume 5, uh, 753, that Christ forewarned his disciples of the destruction of Jerusalem and the signs to take place prior to the coming of the Son of Man. The whole of the 24th chapter of Matthew is a prophecy concerning the events to precede this coming this event and the destruction of jerusalem is used to typify the last great destruction of the world by fire now while these prophecies receive a partial fulfillment at the destruction of jerusalem they have a more direct application in the last days we are further told in the book per 303, paragraph 1, just doing a little review to get to our main subject, 
the ruin of Jerusalem was a symbol of the final ruin that shall overwhelm the world. We are standing on the threshold of great and solemn events. And we are further told that Jerusalem have, I said, the prophecies that receive partial fulfillment in the overthrow of Jerusalem have a more direct application to the last days. And so as we have seen, we have looked at our first presentation, the beginning of sorrow. Um, that was Matthew 24, 1 to 13. And we realize that the central focus is to show us that the calamities will increase. The natural disasters will increase. Pestilence will increase. Jesus told us these things before. Now, what's interesting is that we realize as we studied and we honed in on that uh, 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 presentation that the focus of Satan's hatred to the false Christ and the false prophet was the remnant. Now, let's go forward. The second presentation, we studied the abomination of desolation. And that was Matthew 24, 15 to 21. And we realize again that the focus here is upon a preparation that is necessary for the remnant because of what Satan will do in the latter days. And lastly, we realize um, last week we studied the marvelous working of Satan. And that is Matthew 24, 22 through 28. And so we see that in this presentation, we are told in 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15, um, focusing more so on verse 14 of 2 Corinthians 11, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. We are further told, um, Testimonies to the Church, volume 5, that by the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy, in the violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. And this is found in the book of Revelation chapter 13, where we know that um, prophecies uh, denote that this country will speak as a dragon. Now the dragon in Revelation chapter 12 verse 9 is none other than the devil himself. Now, why is this important for us to understand? Because we are living in the time when Jesus is soon to come. And Jesus told us these things so that when it happened, we might believe and that we might be prepared for the second coming of Christ. Now, we are further told that when the Protestantism shall stretch her hands across the gulf to grasp hands with the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to cl clasp hands with spiritualism, when under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehood and delusion. Then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. And so we see last week, as we looked at the marvelous working of Satan, that just within the context of the last act in the drama, that Satan himself will come to this earth and he will personate Christ. Now, in our study, indeed, they all have a connection. And I know that I'm briefly going over some of these topics for more in-depth understanding. I went a little more in detail. Please visit our YouTube line, Zion Advent SDA. And you know what? Just go ahead and subscribe so that whatever uh, presentation comes out, that you'll be the first to be notified so you can keep abreast with what's going on. But notice with me carefully that Satan, the last act in the drama, Satan will manifest himself as if he is Jesus Christ. Now, 
what we have to remember as we seek to go a little deeper before we actually jump into the last presentation, he knowing he is near, is the question is that why would Satan first want to attack the remnant from the beginning of the book of Matthew up to the point that we are, we, we are at this point we can see clearly that whether it's the beginning of sorrow, whether it's the abomination of desolation, or the marvelous working of Satan, there is one common element. And that common element is the remnant. Satan working through his forces one way or another to try to destroy or first deceive or destroy the remnant. The elect, as the Bible says in the book of Matthew. Now, I want to just remind you carefully of this statement found in Isaiah 14 about Satan, or Lucifer as he was called back then. Now, I hope you, had your, you have your Bibles with you. Please turn with me to Isaiah chapter 14, reading from verse 12 through 14. I want to set a foundation because Satan has a plan, my friends. And just don't think that God has revealed this to us as seventy Adventists, because we are better than anybody else. You see, God wants to save us too. And that if we are in a saving relationship, then you know what? We can reach the world with this message that will prepare a people to stand when Jesus comes the second time. Now, follow with me carefully as you're there in your books, Isaiah 14, verse 12 through 14. Now, what is Satan's plan? Hmm. I want to say this much to you before I go as a precursor. Now, we know that Satan cannot win. Now, why is it that Satan is so aggressive towards putting these plans? Why is he not giving up? Is that an important question? Why is he just, just turning the bucket, as they say? Turning the towel, as they say. We see that this profound answer is found in Isaiah 14. Notice what the Bible says in verse 12 of Isaiah 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Thou art, how art thou cut down to the ground which did, didst weaken the nations? Verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Have mercy. And the stars of God is the angels. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of an ark. Now, I just want to say this much. What Satan is saying but that I want to sit upon the mount of the congregation in the side of an ark, he's saying he wants to take the throne in other words, you want to sit upon the throne and receive worship just like God. Because we see that God is in the side of the north. In the book of Matthew, we are told that Mount Zion is at the side of the north, the city of the great king. Now, follow with me now. It continues to say in verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And this blasphemous statement ends it. I will be like the Most High. Now, you see, Satan wants to be like the Most High. Now, like doesn't mean the Most High. I do believe that Satan knows he can never match the Most High. He knows that God is all-powerful. Now, the question still remains, why would he con still continue to fight against the elect with the intent with the intent that in some way he can be like the Most High. Now I'm going to take you to a couple of scriptures and I pray that you may prayerfully follow along with me as I go forward. Now let's go to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39 and 40. Now this is the faith chapter and we know that we talked about it actually in our second presentation 
that there are men that, you know, this world was not worthy of, that endured torture and persecution. Now, notice what the latter end of Hebrews says about these iconic men of faith that died with the hope of a future brighter than the one in which we are in at this point. Because God has gone to prepare a place for them. But notice what he says here, what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39 and 40. It says, and these all having obtained a good report through faith receive not the promise. What's that promise? God having provided some better thing uh, for us that they without us should not be made perfect. Now you see, my friends, what is this saying to us? You see, Satan knows, follow with me now, Satan knows that God is all-powerful, and he really cannot contest God. But his desire is to be like God. Now, Satan also understands the principle found in this text. So the principle found in this text is saying, there, basically, that those that will live in the latter end, that will stand will reflect God's character a hundred percent. They will live just like Jesus Christ lived. And so as a result, Satan knows that if God accomplish a remnant that will stand, that he has no chance to be like God. Why? Satan has two plans. Notice what Satan plan is. One of those plans is that Satan says, you know what? Hmm. I cannot allow them to get to this point where they are sealed and where, where they are ready. So what I'm going to do, first of all, I'm going to try to deceive them in, an, in as much as possible. Because if I can deceive them, then they will not be ready and Jesus will not have a people to stand. Now remember now, my friends, and I want to just compose uh, this uh, principle a little bit more. Turn with me to Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59 chapter, reading from verse 14 to 16. Notice what it says about the 144,000 that will stand in the latter days. Notice what it says. It says, verse 14, and judgment is turned away backward. And justice stand afar off, for truth is falling in the streets, and equity cannot enter. Verse 15, yea, truth faileth, and he that depart from evil maketh himself a prey. So who is those that depart from evil? Those that fear God? The saints. And the Lord saw it, and, dis and it, it dis displeased him that there was no judgment. In other words, Here's a people that depart from evil in the midst of injustice all around them. Where just judgment is turned backwards. Where justice stands afar off, there is a people that will reflect God's character that wants to depart from evil. But the scripture says that they will make themselves a prey. Why? Because they stand for the principles of God. Now notice what it says. It says there was no judgment. No justice, my friends. Isaiah uh, 59, 16, therefore says, And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his harm brought salvation unto them, and his righteousness sustained him. Now what this is saying to us, there is coming a time when those that serve God, that desire to depart from evil will be a prey. This is the remnant, the 144,000 in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 14, which will have no guile in their mouth and will, will have the, the, the character of God or the name of God written in their foreheads. Now, we are told that there's coming a time when the Lord saw that there was no man, no intercessor. And the Lord, his harm brought salvation unto them and his righteousness sustained them. So in other words, these people will have to stand in the presence of a holy God without an intercessor. 
Now, you know, this is serious, my friends. We cannot even imagine that. Why? Because all through the dispensation from Adam up to this point, we have always had a mediator. There's always been a system of sacrifice or types. And even when Jesus died, he became our intercessor based on the book of Hebrews. In fact, I want to show you how serious this is. When you understand Hebrews chapter 4, the latter end, let us come boldly, is because we have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus the righteous, who knew no sin. And so he could fully represent us before God. And so really and truly, we have never at any time not have an intercessor. But these people will stand without an intercessor. That tells me, therefore, that they have to be in a position where they are not sinning. And they reflect so much a character of God that they can, their prayers are going directly to the Father. Are you hearing me, my friends? Oh, yes. In fact, we are told carefully, Great Controversy, page 6, uh, 48, paragraph 3, speaking of the 144,000 standing without an intercessor, these having been translated from the earth, because only the 144,000 will be translated without seeing death. From among the living are accounted as the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. These are they which has come out of Great tribulation have a passed through the time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. They have endured the anguish of a time of the time of Jacob's trouble. Notice this statement now. They have stood without an intercessor through the final outpouring of God's judgment. And so we see, my friends, that truly. The 144,000 will have to stand without a mediator. Why is this important? And why does Satan consider this in the light of his quest to defeat the elect and to be like the Most High? Now, I want to show you this much, my friends. You see, Satan knows that if God cannot produce a 144,000, that you know how, my friends? Think about it carefully with me. All those that died in faith, they have never, there has never been evidence in those that died in faith, never been an evidence of a people that God has had without an intercessor. In other words, remember my friends, you have to think about it carefully with me now. Please follow with me. Remember, when you are in heaven, angels will not follow us around. Are you hearing me, my friends? They will not take record. No, 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 they weren't designed for that. They will not impress us. Listen, we are going to love God so much that we're not going to even want to sin against him. Throughout the sea systems of eternity. Remember, sin, affliction cannot rise a second time. Satan knows this. And so because he knows this, if Satan can affect the elect that will represent what God can do in those that have died, then Satan can say, well, you have not proven that man can live in the sight of a holy God by himself with a character that is pleasing to you. If Satan can prove that, you know what happened then, my friend? Satan will counter now and says, well, listen, if man cannot live up to the standard, then why do you expect me to live up to the standard? What about the fallen angels? Why, why do they have to live up to the standard? And because Satan knows that he cannot come up against God, his quest, remember now he wants to be like the Most High. His quest is to set up on this earth his kingdom with his subjects and co-rule with God. Are you hearing me, my friends? He knows that he cannot fight God. But he's claiming his right. You see, my friend, Satan is very subtle. And that's the reason. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you Bible, Bible after Bible, my friends. You see, Satan knows that God has a certain time to accomplish his work. Do you know that, my friends? Satan knows, based on studying the scriptures, that God has a certain time to accomplish this. So, is either he can allow, two ways he can work, Satan. Is either he can allow 
for a remnant not to be developed before probation close? Because then he can say, ah, see, you weren't able to fulfill your word in the timetable that you said. Or two, if a people is sealed, then he's going to want to try to destroy them so that there will not be a people that can stand and reflect the character of God. Now notice what we are told in Acts 17, 26 and 27. I'm going to show you that God has a limit. Acts 17, 26 and 27. God has a limit, my friends. And when God reaches this limit, he has to have a people ready to stand. Notice what the Bible says. And has made of all, of one blood, all nations of men for to dwell upon on all the face of the earth. And has determined the times. What does determine mean? Decreed. In other words, he has decreed the times before appointed. That's a pre-schedule, my friends. Appointed and the bounds are the limit. Another word for bounds is limit of their habitation. So in other words, God has declared the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. So this world has a bound, my friends. It has a limit that they should seek the Lord if aptly they might seal after him and find him, though he be not far though he be not far from every one of us. And so we see that Satan knows this, my friends. Satan knows that God has a timetable. And so Satan has redoubled his effort in his last days to try to affect the elect so that God cannot produce a 144,000 so that he can say, listen, I have a right. In fact, if you don't believe me, jot this down. Jot down Jude, uh, uh, verse 9. I think it's Jude 9. You know what happened? Satan came, when Christ came, Michael came to, uh, to resurrect the, the body of Moses, Satan actually came to contend it. You know why? Satan is saying, listen to me, I have a rightful rulership of this subject. Because you have not yet proved that a people can stand within, within your sight without sinning. And so that's why Hebrews says, they without us cannot be made perfect. God is waiting for us to be ready for us to reflect the character so that it can vindicate his justice in allowing those that have died that did not stand in a time without a mediator to justify the fact that they would have stood if they had time. Follow with me now, my friends. In fact, think about the thief on the cross. You see, the thief on the cross didn't, didn't have time to really show the works of repentance. But we are told by the master that he will be in paradise. Amen? And he was assured that day. And so really, you have to understand, God is going based on the understanding that he will have a people. That's the reason why, my friends, that we should seek to strive to be among the 144,000. Because the 144,000 will fully glorify the Father in redeeming those that are on the earth. And it will prove that God can have a people to stand in his presence without sinning against him. And so, my friends, this is the reason why God has to have a people to stand and Satan knows this and Satan is trying to either kill the either deceive the remnant or the elect before they can be sealed and if he cannot do that the next step is to try to kill them my friends so that God cannot have a people to stand you see Satan wants to rule my friends he wants to be like God he wants in fact I want to so, submit to you in the book of Daniel because it's clear in the book of Daniel. Book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 11. Let's go with me. Daniel chapter 11. I'm going to show you this same principle here. In Daniel chapter 11. Daniel 11 chapter. Um, zero down on verse uh, 44. Notice what the Bible says. 
but tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Now, we know that the context here is the king of the north. All right? Now, we know who is the true king of the north. And that's Jesus, because his throne is there. But remember now, this is talking about our earthly power that presume to be in the place of Christ. So this is an anti-Christ power, the king of the north, and you know what happened? Let me tell you something, my friends. You have to remember now. If the book of Daniel is underscoring the last events, do you think that Satan himself is not going to play a part in this? Oh, yes, my friends. He's going to manifest himself as Christ. So when we're reading Daniel chapter 11, 44, we cannot only read it in light of the papacy, which we identify as this Antichrist system. We have to also read it in the context of Satan a whole conglomerate of a system that is opposing God. Now, notice what it says in uh, Daniel eleven forty four. But tidings out of the east shall, and out of the north shall trouble him, which is this Antichrist conglomerate, the beast, the false prophet, as well as Satan. Watch this. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly make away many. So in other words, who is he destroying? It's not those that are deceived. It's those that are the elect that stand for God. But notice what it says here. Verse 45. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Now notice what Satan's step, next step is after he tries to destroy them. He tries to establish his palace, and notice the, the wording, it says the tabernacle of his palace. So the way how Satan is trying to establish himself as the king of the north, or like God, is through worship. He's trying to establish the tabernacle of his palace upon this earth to say that I am the rightful ruler of this earth. And no wonder in the book of Job he presented himself as the one representing earth. And God had to say to him, have you considered my servant Job? Because Satan believes that he is the rightful owner of this earth. But we know that Michael shall stand up. And when Michael stand up, we know that there shall be a time of trouble. And praise God, God shall deliver his people. Everyone found written. That's Daniel chapter 12. And verse 1, written in the book. And so we know that there's going to be a period of time between Michael standing up, close to probation, and his deliverance that God's people have to stand. And let me tell you something, my friends. After probation closed, nobody will, none of the saints will die. We are assured that, my friends. And so Satan wants to kill them, but they'll be protected by angels. Amen. God has promised us, my friends, that he will protect us. He will watch over us. And so this morning, we want to build upon this understanding that truly Jesus will win and that he has an allotted time. So if Satan is pulling out all the stuff, it tells me, my friend, that we should know that he is near. Who is near? In fact, the scripture says, know that it is near even at the door, but the it there, based on the context of Matthew 24, is really the coming of the Lord. So a better rendering, hence uh, my topic this, mo this afternoon, is know that he is near. Now for this, as we go forward, we want to turn to Matthew 24, ver verse 32 through 35. Matthew, the 24th chapter, verse 32 through 35. We're going to look at the lesson um, here at, of the fig tree. We're going to look at the lesson of the fig tree. Our study will be focusing from uh, Matthew 24, verse 29 to 35, but we're going to start from the end and work our way backwards. All right? So let's look at the lesson of the fig tree. Notice what the Bible says carefully. Verse 32, Matthew 24. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, he know that summer is nigh. 
So likewise, likewise what? Likewise, he, when he shall see all these things, know that it is near. Know that he is near, even at the door. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And so, my friends, Jesus said something very important in verse 34. He says, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Now, you see, the reason why Jesus said that is to give us an understanding of where we are in time. You see, my friends, if Satan understands that God has a limit, then he knows that he has so much time to work, to try to deceive, to try to forfeit the plans of God. And so Jesus is letting us also know that this is the time frame in which his coming is near. Now notice with me carefully, my friend. Jesus said, when we shall see all these things, know that his coming is near. So the question is, how near are we in the time of prophecy? And where are we exactly at this point? Why Satan is so diligent towards working against us? Because Satan knows that he has but a short time. Notice, he says, Jesus says, verse 34, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So in other words, Jesus is saying, this generation is not going to pass until my coming occurs based on the signs. Now the question is, which generation is Jesus talking about? Is that an important question? Let's go to verse 29 now. And we're going to read verse 29 to 31. I said we're going to read forward to go backwards. Let's pick up from verse 29. And we're going to read 29 to 31. Notice what the Bible says. And immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Verse 31, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heaven to the other. Now notice with me, it says immediately after the tribulation of those days. Then we see four signs. The sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the star shall fall from heaven, and the heaven shall be shaken. Then, we are told, shall be the sign of the second coming of Jesus Christ. So the generation that see these signs will most certainly see the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, where are we in time? Have these signs already been fulfilled? Where does it say in the scripture that it talks about these signs? Now, let's go quickly, my friends. Um, we want to go to Revelation chapter uh, 6. Revelation the uh, uh, 6 chapter. Revelation the 6 chapter. Uh, reading from verse 12 through 17. But before we go there, as we're turning to Revelation uh, chapter 6, 12 through 17, I want to first underscore something in verse 29. It says, immediately after the tribulation. Now, Remember last week we talked about the tribulation in Matthew, the 24th chapter. Remember we talked about the tribulation that God's people will, be, will have to go through. And we talked about the typology uh, to uh, that uh, tribulation uh, last week. Um, in Matthew chapter 24... It talks about in verse 21 and 22, it says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the world begin, since, 
since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be, and except those days should be shortened, there shall no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And so based on the context here of Matthew, it has to be that same tribulation. But remember what we said is that, that last week, that, that because type and anti-type is not necessarily exactly alike, even though they are similar, um, the great tribulation then continued in, in type. It continued from the destruction of Jerusalem all the way up to the Dark Ages. Remember, we established that last week. And so sometimes, immediately after the Dark Ages, we shall see these signs come to fruition. Are you following with me? Now, notice this statement here, my friends. Because remember, God also said, except those days were shortened. So we know that the papacy in the Dark Age ruled from um, 538 to 1798. So 1798 is not the date that we're looking for. Because God says that the day of tribulation would be shortened. Notice this quotation in uh, uh, Great Controversy 266 uh, and paragraph 4. It says the persecution of the church did not continue throughout the entire period of the 1260 years. That's the, the reign of the papacy, the Dark Ages. God in mercy to his people cut short the time of their fiery trial in foretelling the great tribulation to before the church a saver said except those days should be shortened there should no flesh be saved but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened through the influence of the reformation the persecution was brought to an end prior to 1798 so basically we are look in history and we are looking prior to 1798 for these signs. But notice what Revelation says. If your hand is at Revelation, Revelation chapter 6, zero and down on verse 12 through 17. Notice what the Bible says. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of ear, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll, when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their place. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captain, and the mighty men, and every bondsman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens, and in the rocks of the mountain, and saith, to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And so here we see a parallel set of verses towards Matthew uh, 24, reading from verse 29 through 31. <clears throat> And so we see that here are the, the four, the four uh, signs that we saw in Matthew. The sun became black as sackcloth of year, verse 12. The moon became as blood. The stars of heaven uh, fell to the earth. And notice with me verse 14. Verse 14 says, The heaven departed as a scroll that is rolled together. My friends, this parallel matches completely with the powers of heaven being shaken. And so here we see the four signs that we saw in Matthew. But notice carefully with me that at the beginning, it says at verse 12 that the six seals open. And by the way, there's only, six, there's only seven seals. And when the seventh seal is open, there is silence in heaven because you know what? All heaven will be empty. Are you hearing me, my friends? So Jesus has to come, my friends, at the end of the sixth seal. Follow with me now, my friends. And so really, we realize that at the sixth seal, verse 12, there was a great earthquake, and then these signs should follow. So we have to look within the seventh, we have to look before, sometime before 1798. 
and we have to look for a great earthquake and then we should see if Jesus is soon to come we should see following that earthquake the sun becoming as blood the moon uh, be, the sun becoming as black as sackcloth the moon becoming as blood the stars of heaven falling and eventually the fourth sign the powers of heaven should be shaken and then we should see the sign of the son of man where the kings and the great men and all these men are hiding themselves from the presence of the lamb for his great day of his wrath is come now when we look in history my friends in November, and I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. November 1st, 1755. History record one of the greatest earthquakes. Now, I want to say this much. The Lisbon earthquake was not so much great because of the Arictus scale in terms of its magnitude. It was great because of all the lands how much millions of square miles that this thing affected. No earthquake has ever, to that point, affected so much land, land mass. And let me tell you something, my friends. This thing happened on All Saints Day. Men thought that Jesus was coming. They were terrified. Churches were in session, and churches crumbled. Ireland disappeared, my friends, because of tsunamis and all those things that followed and many a life Bridget, was, 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 was destroyed and so this earthquake was very significant but does it fit the bill because if it fits the bill we should see shortly thereafter or following it the sun becoming black as sackcloth, the moon turning to blood the stars of heaven falling and the powers of heaven shaking now, my friends, I want to tell you this much. The signs do start before 1798 because this is 1755. Let's continue to see if we'll see the rest of the signs follow. My friends, we are told that just a couple of years after that, about 25 years after that, my friends, in 1780, the sun was darkened. Man could not even see in, and you know what, my friends, it's funny because it was pitch day. God did not wait until night to eclipse the sun because the sun would not be out naturally. You understand me, my friends? It was pitch day. It was noon, high day. And it was, this was a very strange phenomenon. And the darkness continued, my, my friends, pitch black. We are told that somebody could lift their hands up and not see their very hands in front of their face. And this is all history. These are signs of the times, my friends, that Jesus coming is at the door. Amen. And this happened May 19, 1780. In fact, the very night, we are told, the same night, the moon became as blood. Can you imagine how men were terrified? And those that studied the scripture knew that these were the signs of the second coming of Jesus. Now you may say, preacher man, yes, so far. We have seen the earthquake. So we know that we're under the sixth six, six seal. We have seen the sun being blackened. We have seen the moon turn to blood. But what about the stars falling? Did it happen? Oh, yes, it did. November 13, 1833. We are told that the stars fell from heaven, my friends. November 13, 1833. The sky was lit. It was like day, my friends, the way how meteor was all over the place. You can do your history, my friend. This is all in history. Now, if this is, if this is true, that means sign one, two, three has taken place. What sign is left before the coming of the Lord? Let me read for you once again, Matthew 20, 24, 29. It says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened. That happened. Sign number one. The moon shall not give her light. It turned to blood. Sign number two. It happened. The stars shall fall from heaven. Sign number three. It happened. 1833. Are you with me, my friends? Now what is left to happen? The fourth sign says, 
the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Now let's parallel that with Revelation 6, 13 and 14. Go with me and parallel it. 13, Revelation 6, 13 and 14. Notice what 13 says. The stars of heaven, the stars, the stars shall fall from heaven. That's the third sign. So which one is left? The fourth sign is left, which is what? The powers of heaven shall be shaken. Notice what verse 14 says. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their place. My friends, the powers of heaven shaken is the rolling of the heaven like a scroll preparing the way for Jesus because we see that the next thing that takes place, my friends, is the second coming of Jesus Christ. No wonder Satan wants to do away with many. No wonder Satan doesn't want us to be prepared. No wonder Satan is trying to deceive the remnant all through the book of Matthew. Because he knows we are on borrowed time. So where are we, my friends? We are we in time. My friends, the next great event before Jesus comes is for the heavens to open as a scroll. Oh, my friends, I tell you, we are on borrowed time. And so basically where we are in Matthew 24 and verse 29, we are right between, we are right in the midst of verse 29. That's where we are right now, my friends, as we speak. And do you know, my friends, that between the third sign and the fourth sign, the beginning of Cyrus fits in there, the abomination of desolation fits in there, the marvelous working of Satan fits in there, and the latter end is the second coming of Jesus, my friends. We are told, early writings, page 41, paragraph 1. Notice this, my friend. It says the powers of heaven will be shaken at the voice of God. Then the sun, the moon, and star will be moved out of their places. They will not pass away, but they will be shaken by the voice of God. Are you hearing me, my friends? We are further told in paragraph 2 of that same page, dark. And heavy clouds came, together, came up and clashed against each other. The atmosphere parted and rolled back. Then we could see, we could look through the open space in Orion whence came the voice of God. The holy city will come through the open space. I saw that the powers of earth are now being shaken. And that events come in order. Wars, rumors of wars, sword, famine. Pestilence are first to shake the powers of earth. Then, we are told, my friends, the voice of God will shake the sun, the moon, the stars, and even the earth, my friends. Revelation tells us that, that mountains will move out of your places. And we are told carefully in the book of Revelation, my friends, that truly what will really take place is that the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich man, the chief captain, the mighty man, the every bond man, and every free man, and will hit themselves in dens of rocks of the, of the mountains. And we say to the mountains and the rock, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that seated upon the throne and from the face of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. And so, my friends, Right now, we are on borrowed time. Oh, my friends, Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1 says it this way. When the seventh, it says, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half hour. My friends, as I bring this to a close, you know the reason why there will be silence in heaven? All heaven will be empty. Why? Because God would have left with the angels, with Jesus. And they would have come to deliver God's people. Jesus would have come the second time. Oh, my friends, we are living in solemn times. Indeed, we are living in a time when we recognize that truly Jesus is soon to come. While the world 
is running to and fro and they're concerning themselves about everything that Jesus said will happen. The signs of the times. Yet still, they are not conscious to the reality that, listen, Jesus is about to come. Men's hearts are failing them for fear. When Christ is about to come, my question is, are we ready for Jesus to come? Oh, my friends, I'm not fearful of the coronavirus. You know, Jesus did not promise us that we would not die for those that are on this side of probation. And you know what, my friends? The most important part is to know that we are hidden Christ. If you are hidden Christ, whether you live or you die, then one day you'll be raised at the voice of God. You will be caught up together, whether you live or you die, to meet him in the air. Oh, my friends, I want to be ready. And I hope that it is your desire by the grace of God to be ready. It's time to get our house in order. Jesus is soon to come. And for those that are parleying with iniquity, those that are living in sin, my friends, turn your life over to Jesus. Give him your heart. Maybe you have never really made a decision to follow Jesus, but Jesus is saying, my coming is at the door. All these things that are happening is showing you that I want to have a people that will stand. Because Satan is just deceived, God will have a people that will stand. A people that will stand and will reflect his character 100%. We are told that when the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim and redeem them for his own. And so really, God is really waiting for us. Oh, my friends, he doesn't want to come before you are ready. He wants our family to be ready. He wants the world to be ready. But not everybody will be ready. Only those that make a conscious decision to follow Jesus. And so if it is your desire to really live for God, to surrender your heart to Jesus Christ, will you just kneel with me at this time As you listen, just listen to the words of this song. And I'm going to pray. The theme of the Bible is Jesus and how he died to save men. The plan of salvation assures us He's coming back again. Are you ready for Jesus? To come, are you faithful in all that you do? Have you fought a good fight? Have you stood for the right as others see Jesus? In you, are you ready to stand in your place? And are you ready to look in his face? Can you look up and say, this is my Lord. Are you ready for Jesus to come? Don't cling to this world and its pleasure. This earth will soon pass away. Oh, give me your heart, 
without measure he is calling you today are you ready for jesus to come are you faithful in all that you do can you look up and say this is my lord are you ready for jesus are you ready for Jesus? Are you ready for Jesus to come? Please kneel with me, O oh, loving Father, who art in heaven. Lord, our desires to be ready. And so, Lord, we are not distracted by the things going on around us. For we know that your coming is at the door. We know, dear God, that truly you are soon to make your appearing. All the signs are foretelling, and you have said this generation that see these signs. Lord, we have already seen most of the signs. And the only one left is for the heavens to roll back as a scroll. Oh, God, help us to put away sin. Help us to serve your Lord, for we know that we have a place in this great plan of redemption, Lord, to glorify you as never before, to stand in the latter days, to stand as evidences of what the gospel is able to do in the life of those that trust you. And so, Lord, I commit myself to thee afresh. I commit everyone on the prayer line to you. Lord, you know they're going out and they're coming in. You know every struggle. Have mercy, dear God, upon your people. And Lord, as our endeavor is to see your face and to live with you, grant, Lord, that we will be ready for that great day that is soon approaching, that is upon us, that is even at the door. I know that you are even now knocking on the doors of our heart. And Lord, you're such a gentleman. You have been waiting for us so long. Help us to yield to you. Forgive us for our delay, Lord. And help us to surrender. Lord, even maybe there may be somebody on the line. The Lord want to give their life to you afresh. Oh God, I pray that you would be with that person, Lord. As they are willing to make this commitment, maybe, oh God, that they will fully realize that Jesus is well pleased. That, Lord, they will do so. Make a commitment to surrender to you. Knowing, Lord, that they will never regret that decision. Bless and keep your people, Lord, as we continue to be faithful. Thank you for your love and for your words. And at last, Lord, may we be found worthy because Jesus is worthy to reign with you eternally. This is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.